making the rounds a little bit, you know, visiting with people. And I'm trying to get out. You know, I got Melissa and Rick, my people that did my book. I found them when they, to do a website for me because I wanted people to know that I was still alive. Yeah. Like, I don't know where, what Jerry Crutchfield is doing or what James Stroud is doing yeah. or Paul Worley. So I, I just wanted to raise my my profile and I hired them to do my website. And then she talked me into doing a book, got me a deal. And I just kept them on as my managers because they, they get me out because I was, I was, I'm really introverted, you know, for the most part until I get around people I know that I have a chatterbox. Yeah. I don't see you as introverted. No, I am though. I don't. And you know, and when I was at MCA for 25 years and Universal South, everybody knew where I was. If they could get past Willie at the front desk and Renee (laughs) at the office, they could. They knew I was in there. But I was thinking nobody knows where I live and they don't know my number. So I got a website and uh, and also, you know, I'm still vain. I try to look as young as I can. (laughs) And so, you know, I want. I just wanted to get back out there and. And it's it's a young man's world, so it's not. I mean, nobody yeah. wants nobody wants to hire a seventy three year old guy to produce the records of B A and R and stuff like that. Why not? Well, they just they don't experience doesn't work anymore. It's youth works. Uh huh. I mean, youth we, youth works. That's what it is. Are you working with no one? No, I'm working. Here's, here's what I did. I'm okay. starting all over again. Okay. So, uh, like, I don't want to just do. Records now, I mean, I'm so happy I was sitting in my chair from 89 to 97. The gilded years, right? That's when all of us were selling 2 million, 3 million, 4 million. We thought we were geniuses. People, records were selling, right? Yeah. And now it's streaming, all this kind of stuff. So the only money you make is your advance. Uh-huh. It never recoups. Uh-huh. I mean, my first George Strait record sold 6 million. My first White Hunter record sold 6 million. I had two or three Reba and Vince records that sold four or five. Mm-hmm. They don't happen anymore. Yeah, I mean, there's like maybe three acts that do that. Right. So I was going. When I cut a record, I li- I live it. I mean, I, you're the same way. You and Ronnie yeah. are the same way. I live it. I got to do the vocal comps, and I know when the artist is like in the funk, and they go, "That's good." I go, "No, it's not. You're cheating, man." <laughs> like why not? would growl when she couldn't hit a note. I'd call her on it. Yeah. And I found this guy. CMT had a series called Sun Records, about the million dollar quartet, uh-huh. Cash. Elvis, uh, Jerry Lee, and Carl Perkins. Mm-hmm. Did you see that? No. There was a uh, there was a guy that I played, remember hearing about it. Yeah, it was on, only it. for one season. Yeah. There was a kid that played young Elvis, mm-hmm. and he boy he nailed it to a T. Mm-hmm. I mean, he looked like Elvis at, when he was young. So I met him and I said, "Hey man, if you ever decide to uh, if you want to cut some records or make some music, give me a call." So he came to see me. He's 21 now. It's, it's two years ago, he came to see me. And uh, he said, I think I'll take you up on that. I said, well, what kind of music do you do? I didn't know if he was going to do like Stray Cats or right. Michael Buble or whatever. Mm-hmm. I didn't know. And he said, I like George Strait. I said, well, that's not really in right now, you know. But let me hear you. So he sang me uh, one of George's songs, You Look So Good in Love. Or something uh-huh. like that. And you could tell he... He was so intimidated. He sounded so square. You know, when you see Miss America and these people sing, these women sing, they got a vibrato, they sing in pitch. Yeah. All throat, no heart. Yeah, right? let it go. Let's go to paper. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't sound good on speakers, it doesn't hurt. Yeah. And so uh, I got him to get vocal lessons. I got him a deal with Broken Bow. So it's taken two years for them to let us go in. He'd been writing with Terry McBride. Been we'll get him therapy. He'll be okay. Getting therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and so he's got to deal with Broken Bow, and we're about to finish an album. So that's my sort of mainstream. I know it's got to work because he's young and single. He's, he's a good kid. He's like, uh, if, if I say the any the F word around him, he kind of cringes. He's like a good American kid, right? Uh-huh. Uh, and he's just drop dead cool looking like straight is, uh-huh. like straight was. So I think that'll work. And then I'm working on Gary Allen's new album with Mark Wright. Oh, good. Really? Me and, Mark, me and Mark Wright did Smoke Rings in the Dark and All Right Guy, which was his two last platinum albums. How fun. So I hadn't worked with Mark since then. How's he doing? He's doing good. He's only got one leg, but I he's know. doing good. I called him after they took his foot off. Yeah, I know. Just... <laughs> I said, man. Ask him what they did with it. I said, uh, Mark, I'm sorry you only got one leg, but I know somebody wants to buy your shoes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he's still funny. He's he's funnier than me. I'm not funny. He's funny. <laughs> but we've been having a blast, and we we cut six songs that are like, why are these available? I mean, why? You know, cut all the great writers, uh huh, Steve Bogard and all those guys. And so one of the pluggers said, you know, right now, all these track guys that are cutting records, like like Busby was, right. Ross Copperman, right. Forrest Green Whitehead, Luke Laird, Shane McAnally. They write these songs with the artists. Mm -hmm. They use drum loops, then they play the guitars, mm -hmm. sing the background vocals. And Dale Dotson, a plugger at, at uh, Sony, said, there's no traps to run. He said, I wish you'd, I wish you'd produced again, because <laughs> I got to get my writers to write with the artists if I want to cut. But I got all these great songs and I want to pitch them to. So we got these Great songs. And guess what? Gary Allen's going to reappear this year in 2020. Great. So I got me an artist that I know works, and I think radio's ready for that again. Because, you know, Gary's like Keith Urban. He, he's contemporary looking. He's not, he's not a hat act. He's not a cap act. <laughs> he's, he's just got that. He's tube. Gary. He's Gary Allen. He's like Gary had Church. his own thing. Yeah. yeah, you know, and so he's a surfer kid from LA. I love Gary. Yeah. But with me and Mark, I just, and I forgot how great Mark Wright is as a producer. Yeah. He's got good ideas. So I'm fired up, man. Good. And I'm on Kix Brooks's show good. here. Good. I mean, you know, I, I remember back in the day, good. I got called all the time. So <laughs> uh, to get called for this was the big deal for me. No, man, that's great. Some guy stopped me. I came out of Palm of the day and he says, man, you're George Strait's producer. <laughs> I said, I was for 20 years. He said, nice to meet you, Byron Gallimore. <laughs> and I realized how nobody knows who the producers are. So it sort of brought me back down to the ground. And so when I got invited to do this, I was going, and, I, and I, I'm doing Gary, and I found this girl. I'm going, I'm back <clears throat> in the business again. Well, it's good. And it, it's good to, uh, to hear you excited. Oh, I am. And, and then, you know, I, I'm, I'm ready to That's what gets to, artists fired up. You huh? know, that's that's well. You and know, you've and always been good at that. You know, you you inspire people to to want to do their thing and to be good at it. And, to and be you know, better. that's and I think that's what see, people said. Why do you think it works so good for you as an A and R person? And I think it's because I came to town as a musician, and I've I still dress like a musician. You know, <laughs> I'm not a I'm not a suit guy, and uh and there's there's artists in this business that grow up to be like adults. You and Ronnie are not one of them. Keith Urban's <laughs> not going to be one of them. Uh, you know, George Strait is an adult. Alan Jackson is an adult. Uh, I was with Tim Dubois at the CMA show about three years ago. My ticket cost $1,500. And I remember the day I was always in the first three rows because I had like five things nominated. Uh huh. And so here I bought a $1,500 ticket. I'm about three quarters of the way to the back. And I'm sitting behind this little satellite place where Hunter Hayes is going to play a song. I can't even see the stage. And I'm going, this doesn't work, man. I'm spoiled rotten. <laughs> and I saw Tim Dubois to my left over in the corner. I said, hey, Tim, now you know how the Oak Ridge Boys feel. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, you know, I'm just glad that, that I'm fired up again. And you know about Oak Ridge Boys. That's right. I mean, it, you know, obviously you're you're – Great run as a as a record executive is pretty well known, but like we met, we met. I can't. I think you were maybe just like early '80s. Were you already working for Silver Silverline? Yeah, Gold? I was. I was so, no, I was actually playing with the Oaks and writing. They gave me a writer's deal. I wasn't a writer. It was like a token writer's deal. But you know, I got to hang out with Steve Earle, who wrote for them, and right. Kimbo Henson. So I was. I took a writer's draw. And I think that's when I first met you, and you were a solo artist at the time. Yeah, sort of. Well, you know, you were. <laughs> you know, you actually, what you helped me in the cup, because I remember I was writing for Gant. And, oh, uh, I miss him. And man. I had, oh, don't we all? Um, those great song guys. Oh, don't you miss those days on Friday afternoon, Don Gant office around five the doors open it was on you walk send in there jimmy like, gun out for a couple of yeah. cases of beer that's right and people would start showing up walk up keith whitley would be in there yeah you'd be in there i mean buffett Rafe, whoever you know Rafe Rafe Boy. Wouldn't live there and then roger Sovine would be competing <coughs> at sony up there uh, upstairs with more beer that was so 
so exciting for for songwriters. I hate you know that's the one thing, and you hate acting like man, it ain't like it used to be. I know, but it ain't. <laughs> but man, Music Row came alive at five o'clock because everybody been in banging on their guitars all day. And it mattered because there was a bit of a competition that started at five. It's like, sure did. what'd you write today? And Rafe would come in and play something he'd written, or Mickey Newberry What's would show up. Or, or, yeah, I know it. And you're just like, oh crap! And you'd be sit. But Gant was also that's a, you know a song guy like him. Even if I'd, I you know he goes, what'd you write? He said, I don't even want to play it. He goes, I want to hear it. So you know you're in a room full of these guys that are your heroes. You play some song that you don't even believe in yourself, but Gant would find those two lines I know. that were worth a damn in that song, and he'd go, man, he goes, what were the, what'd you say? He said, so-and-so. So he goes, freaking great. So, and he would repeat it like three times and make sure everybody in the room knew this mo this little kernel of brilliance that you had tell, in a half-assed song. And then he would tell everybody on the row about that song, Yeah, and pretty soon they'd see you. Hey, play me that song, Kicks. <laughs> Don Gant told me it blew him away. Yeah. Those, you know, I, I miss those days too. I think that's what people like the Bluebird and the Listening Room with these, uh, where they have like guitar pulls with like writers. They're trying to recreate that, but it's not the same. Because, you know, in, in Don Gant's office, somebody would walk in there that just dropped by because they heard it was something happening. Yeah. And then someone would pass them a guitar and Maybe Rafe had just played What's Forever Four, and Don Cook had played something, and they'd hand them the guitar, play me something, and then they're on, they're on, yeah. oh man. Yeah. It made you want to do you, What do you play? You got to be good. How do you follow that? <laughs> you know, I, I've sort of, at the Bluebird one time, back when the Bluebird, before it became a tourist attraction. All right. I used to love going there and seeing Bob DePiro and Gary Nicholson and Gary Burr. Just sit around and play great songs. Uh, when I have together. lived in there too. It was a great. And when great JD Souther there. had just moved to town, and so you know, he was like the special guest that night. Mm -hmm. So everybody thought he was just going to blow Gary Burr and Gary Nicholson away, and they gave him the guitar, and he had to follow those guys, and he choked, and he said, "Hey guys." I'm sorry, but man, I'm just choking right now. I'm not sure I can follow this. <laughs> and so I think Don said, sing uh, some Eagle song right. he'd written. And it's kind of lightened the load for him. Uh -huh. But that's a hard place to be. But that's what those days like you're talking about. They just don't exist anymore. And it's all because I don't think those songwriters are writing hooks these days. You know who Bob Letbitz is? Oh, sure. You know, he's the one that... Read him daily. Yeah, uh, Taylor wrote mean about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was on a panel with him, and uh, people, that's all they want to talk about is that song and him putting her down. He said, listen, I wasn't, I, I wasn't putting Taylor down. I was just giving her some grief that night on because she was so famous and that Stevie Nicks thing on the Grammys where she sang out a key. He said, and by the way, she wrote great songs back then. Now she's writing hooks, and there's a difference. Pop, you know, pop music and country music Hooks seem to fly right now. And and songs like a Bobby Braddock song used to be a, a movie. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. the songs that Brooks and Dunn cut, I can't believe, I think one of the most proudest moments of my life is when Believe won for Single of the Year because of, of all the great songs y'all have cut over the years, Neon Moon, Red Dirt Road, two of my favorite, uh, only in America. I mean, there's so many. Uh, uh, she's not the cheating kind. Why didn't they win single of the year? You know, but I, I was so happy that I, I won. And I didn't even go up on stage because the producer gets to go up on stage. And I was going, man, I blew that. Because <laughs> to this day, when I walk down the street, uh, there's a, people usually say one or two things to me. You did believe, right? And I said, yeah, I did. That's my favorite song. And, uh, and and we're talking about people that like songwriters or pluggers. Yeah. People that should like hate your guts because they're jealous, <laughs> not a tourist, you know. And I'm proud to have been a part of that song. And I remember it took forever to go up the charts. I kept going, I kept asking Clarence, is it dying? Oh, no, be careful. Be cool. It's going to make it. And it climbed and climbed and climbed. And I missed that too. So I'm kind of glad to get back into business. 
to see if I can compete. And I want to be a game changer like it was in 89 when Garth and Clint and you guys and Alan and Vince came along the class of 89, right? I want that to happen again in 2020. Well, a couple of things. One, it's interesting that Believe, I think, stopped at number eight or something. Did it really? So, yeah. Well, so, and so, by Morning never made top number yeah, one, and you know, Fancy never made number one. But it was one. a huge impact song, and we have people all the time, you know, obviously because it's, you know, it has the connotations that it does, and it's not even a religious song. No, but... Uh, but, but it is a spiritual song, and... Something that we all think. I about. never knew. Never went number one. I didn't. No, know I think that. it stopped at eight or something like that. But it was a huge impact record for us. Well, it's like the big one of the biggest records you'll ever have. Fancy yeah. for Reba stopped True. at ten. Yeah. Amarillo by Morning, my favorite George Strait song, which Blake Mevis cut, stopped at like five, right? Yeah. So it's. I think fans sometimes it just helps them to know. Just because all the stations aren't playing the heck out of it all at the same time. You know, there's there's things that go on, but but those records have lives of their own and are sometimes big impact records.